Um, so this talk is really for those of you who would love to digitize with aerial imagery at Zoom level 24 or greater. <clears throat> um, I'm Liz Barry, and uh, I'm a proud contributor to OpenStreetMap. Also, I'm a community member at the Public Lab, and I'm also a co-founder of the nonprofit organization. Um, we you, generally we develop tools so that people can do their own environmental research. But one particular tool chain we have is very relevant to OpenStreetMap, and I'm glad to share it with you. Uh, we're going to cover sort of history of this of aerial mapping, um, basically how you can do it. We're going to have some variations about near infrared imagery, and then current initiatives and how you can get involved. Um, this is a uh, this is imagery of Dolores Park that um, some folks took on a beautiful sunny day, and um, and you're <laughs> in a silly way we're kind of looking at the folders for all the zoom levels um, of the imagery you could use um, in OpenStreetMap. You can get your own by this simple method: um, a kite holding a camera up in the air, um, and you know, for about a $50 price point. So we're talking about open hardware for mapping, and the open hardware license is very important to this. Um, this license guarantees that anyone who's using um, open hardware will never be forced to pay a license fee by anyone who originally created it, and also that people downstream will continue contributing back any improvements to the people who first created this way of capturing data. Um, and we believe further that uh, the definition of open hardware includes that the objects are of self-evident design, that the way you can make more of them should be self-evident. Um, here's just some sketches of the kind of MacGyver approach of balloons and uh, plastic bottles for crash protection and tape, lots of tape. Um, but actually, the system allows you to fly to one or 2,000 feet and make maps at two centimeter resolution. And people got together. Um, this is somewhat of a well-known story during the BP oil spill, where people were spotting tar balls and reporting sightings on crowd maps. And fishermen were pissed off because they couldn't go out. And journalists were pissed off because the airspace was closed. And so on left, you see some people just setting up a rig uh, with some children's toy type activity and doing better than what was available in the public satellite imagery. Doing better both before, during, and after the oil spill and collecting evidence that's now going through court um, of failing booms and <clears throat> uh, lasting damage. So after all that, we formed into um, a nonprofit and we actually sell kits for people to do their own mapping. Um, and we make software for georeferencing the images you create. Just a simple rubber sheeting. Um, grab the corners and position it over existing uh, satellite imagery. When you hit export, um, we create a lot of great formats for you to use. And I'm going to show you uh, what you can do with the tile layer. Um, in this example, a group was fighting in Uganda to, to preserve the land tenure of this community marketplace. And they, they created this map here, completed in MapNitter. This is what they replaced. Um, and the export formats that you get when you create a map in MapNitter um, automatically give you a link to just edit in Potlatch or the new ID editor. So here's that same map. And this map was actually always made with the endpoint of digitizing an OpenStreetMap. <coughs> Um, if you, this is the installation on OpenStreetMap.us. If you prefer OpenStreetMap.org, you can also click the background layers and just paste in the URL to your imagery and get the same thing. So um, versatile, versatile data, it moves around not only digitally, but we print it out. Uh, we have a quarterly newsletter that combines not only the maps that people make, but also essays and interviews on why they made it and explains who the ongoing research leads are in those places. Um, and on any map, you can always click the button to go print one out for yourself. 
Uh, we also distribute to Google. Uh, we're a data provider. And um, the main reason we do it is because the credit in lower left-hand corner to public laboratory is a click through to the original MapKnitter page where your username is and your cartography notes explain what that data means. It's sort of like a, a data Trojan horse of inserting uh, your agency um, into um, what's accepted as the global corporate source. Um, back to the hardware. Obviously, um, juice bottles are shaped differently. Cameras have different models. Tape is more or less sticky. And all in all, people have different wind and terrain conditions and um, skill levels when assembling these things. And so obviously, the way of doing this has just multiplied. Um, uh, a popular way uh, to make this even more social, um, a real mapping party is with party balloons. This is a favorite during um, parades and protests, and actually very frequently has been accompanied with um, live streaming to Ustream and hopefully soon People TV. We try to keep things simple. Um, we modify very um, common, literally like the camera that you were given, you know, six years ago. We want to use that. I, it's just sitting in that box. I know you have this camera. Um, um, those imaging sensors are very high quality. And, well, we needed to take pictures pretty often. So, yes, you could put a script on the SD card, or you could just tie a knot in a string and hold it down on the shutter button with a rubber band, and it'll just keep taking pictures. Um, you don't need commercial kites. You could make your own out of discarded housing, you know, house construction materials and more tape, dowels, bamboo anything. Um, but if balloons and kites aren't your way to get into the air, if you find yourself airborne more often yourself in a plane, um, I want to tell you about what you can do with passenger pigeon, which is uh, snap a window, out, uh, snap a picture out the window of a plane, and um, through a partnership with flight stats, you can type in your flight number and the time you took a picture, and they'll give you the coordinates. And then it's very easy to take your single image to map knitter and pin it down. And can't you imagine if you're working somewhere, you know, if you're flying into a city and you plan to do an open street map workshop, you could collect higher resolution base imagery on your way in. Um, who doesn't love drones? We all, we all love drones. But I have to say <laughs> that um, they crash. They don't stay up very long. They can't stand the wind. They can't stand the weather. And if you go out with a couple different kinds of kites to, you know, to deal with the wind as it peaks midday, um, you could essentially care, you know, be capturing continuous imagery with a really basic skill level. And if you have trouble flying kites, just ask your nearest 10-year-old neighbor. Um, there are some you know, more serious reasons that we preferred tethered airborne equipment, which is that you can trace back the string to who's operating it. And you can ask them what they're doing. <clears throat> so um, here's some of the variations on a theme. Um, Near-infrared imaging is um, one of my favorite things right now. And it turns out that um, all of our consumer cameras, those sensors are already sensitive to infrared imaging. And I'll explain a little bit more about why plants show up so well that way. Um, but with a jeweler screwdriver, you can open up the back of your camera and remove the filter that's stopping your camera from being this kind of instrument. So we did that, and we found ourselves flying two sets of cameras, one regular and one with that filter removed and something else to block regular RGB from getting in. And right away, people started analyzing the vegetation in their community gardens or spotting nutrient plumes in their favorite local Superfund site. And so we got serious about it. And um, it's now our third Kickstarter campaign. It's online right now. It's called Infragram. I know, it's hard to say. <laughs> you can call it a plant cam, but the hashtag is Infragram. And um, why it works so well for plants, because as much green as plants look to our eye. See the green is like, okay, more green than red and blue. The plants are reflecting green. But they're reflecting a crazy amount of near infrared that human eyes aren't sensitive to. 
So with this camera that's now an all-in-one solution, um, the raw image looks kind of bland because we've commandeered the blue channel to store infrared, so the, the visible colors are off. But you can process it, and this is another example of a picture snapped out the window of a plane. Look at how you can capture the extent of urbanization and land cover. You can analyze um, wetlands in a single photo to see how development pressures are affecting them, or to see if that Army Corps of Engineers restoration plan is really working. Um, obviously, Landsat imagery is already providing this. Look in the upper right-hand corner. Uh, the, I mean, the projector's kind of weak. But in visible inf imagery, you really can't tell what's land and what's water. Um, and, and this is a shout out to another project, not a public lab project, but a project you should know about if you love this kind of imagery. Open IR um, is, is a fantastic project to let you pull in Landsat layers. And this is the sort of um, the recipe of which bands how far out in the infrared range should be combined so that you can identify vegetation or soil moisture or many other um, typical environmental classification factors. Um, so give them a look up and see if we can't convince them to give us those simple tile URLs to put an open street map for, for tracing everywhere. Um, so what's coming up next, um, we're super happy that we have a Google, three Google Summer of Code fellows and um, that, uh, if you remember the infogram image that was bland but required processing, we do have a, a web app for that, but we're going to make it run on Android really well. Um, we're also, for people who don't want to hack their existing cameras but want to put their phone up, we're making a, an Android app um, that will be helpful for controlling your aerial rig. Um, and also some g new features for Spectral Workbench, which is one of our other tools that I'm not going to talk about right now. Um, also coming up, a fantastic idea from Nathan of Argyle Tiles is um, taking advantage of structure from motion, which when you get a lot of pictures from above a site, they're from a lot of different angles. And there's already many projects that let you dump a bunch of images in and get a 3D model. And then taking the straight top-down view of that gives you a map or gives you an image that you can georeference. Um, a really fast way to make maps, and this is something of interest to the drone community as well. See, we can work together. Um, so this is my last slide. Um, Public Lab is very happy to collaborate with OpenStreetMap. Um, we love when our workflows align, and we're always looking for uh, more projects that we can do together. So um, here's how to find us, and uh, let's have some questions. Thank you. Uh, yeah, right there. Yeah, you can use helium or hydrogen. Um, it depends where you are. Um, but for over a century, the Weather Service has just had a little bucket where they can make hydrogen in the field whenever they need it. So maybe we should work on that. Yeah? It's called infogram sort of like infrared photogrammetry plus Instagram. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, um, there are balloon mapping regulations. And keeping your balloon less than six feet in diameter, holding on to it with a, a strong line, having a payload of less than five pounds, which these cameras are, and, and without any permission at all, you can go up to 500 feet. Um, and we never have pro our The reels we sell go have 1,000 feet of line already wound on them. Um, if you're going to be near an airport, like within five miles, Check with the, the FAA, and it's documented on our site. Um, otherwise, um, uh, people can help you with the regulations, because I think actually the whole city of DC now has more restrictions on it. Uh huh. Any other questions?
Yeah. Oh, yeah. The question was, um, isn't there a way to program the camera? And there definitely is. Um, we love working with Canon cameras, especially cheap ones from eBay. And there's a, another great open source project called the Canon Hack Development Kit. Uh, it's, a little, it's a little janky to use, but I use it. And you can, you can control your camera from your SD card and set the interval. And um, you can find some documentation on our site or hit the list about that. Um, well, it's only five, but it's the end of the second day of this conference. So, uh, OK, one more question. Well, the Infogram project was actually demanded by wetland scientists in the Gulf Coast um, because the Army Corps of Engineers kind of speaks in the language of infrared. And the community observations, community complaints, community anecdotal stories, none of that was getting anywhere until the community could issue a data set in the same format. And so um, the community was already doing aerial mapping since the BP oil spill. And they said, we need to track the survival of these wetlands. We need to photograph in infrared. So we started hacking around on that. Cool. Well, I'm going to um, close this computer now. Thank you.